<laughs> Ross? And I'm Dean. And they're from the Cosmic Psychos, and I'm not, but my name's Matt Weston. <laughs> and you're <laughs> and watching... You're watching... 9-11. No? Noise 11. Noise 11. Don't cough. <laughs> Dunderhead. Ross Knight, Dean Muller, and Matt Weston, three blokes you can trust here at Noise 11. <laughs> the man who made the Cosmic Psychos movie and the Cosmic Psychos. Good to have you in. Howdy. Thanks and uh, congratulations on the movie too. I mean, I should be saying it to all of you. I'll start with you there first, uh, Matt. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, nice work. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, for you, Ross and, and, and Dean, to put yourself up there on the big screen, tell the story, uh, you know, there's a lot to be told, I guess, in the course of the last 30 years. And, you know, it's a brutally honest movie as well. Yeah, I think Matt's timing was perfectly uh, perfectly perfect in some <laughs> ways too, where he probably got, probably got a fair bit that Biden might not have got. At, at different times, so there seemed to be a lot of stuff going on then. So, but yeah, no, he did a good job. We, we did, did bugger job. all, really. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, was he getting you when you were getting them when they were vulnerable? Were they? Yeah, I think I just said, I oh, don't worry. Drunk. I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you an edit before <laughs> we drunk. release it, and then yeah. Uh, yeah, it's too late then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, the art of making an artist spill their guts, Matt. Mm. You know, it really came down to that, didn't it? It kind of did. Yeah. Thankfully, these guys were open. All jokes aside, mm. and. Um, it took a it took a while to get it all out. Over, I mean, I think our, the first interview was October, two thousand and eleven, and the final interview would have been just before Christmas last year. So, you know, I chose my moments when to ask the curlier questions, I guess. But mm -hmm. yeah, why the cosmic psychos? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the suggestion came to me from um, Dean's wife, and I was between projects at that time, and um, she mentioned you know maybe you should look at doing a cosmic psychos film he had dropped off to our place a while before that a box of vhs and beta cassettes and you know super eight films and just this box of Crying tangled sketches up, you know mm. you know all the, all the tape ripped out of them and stuff and we we watched a couple and just we were blown away by some of the footage stuff with um ross in a tarago with the members of Nirvana with Chris Novoselic driving. Oh. I mean, this isn't even in the movie. He uh, having a car accident in Sydney, going up the ass of a. Well, don't tell anyone that people might watch the film. Now. <laughs> they might, they might oh, oh yeah, well, <laughs> no, it might be in there. He might have edited it. Um, but yeah, just stuff like that. Uh, and uh, we was going, geez, this is all behind the scenes. Really good, kind of you know, grungy rock and roll stuff. Oh. So riding white stallions with the Bangles down a beach. Yeah. That time that didn't quite make it either. Yeah, doing it might not have ever happened. Footage wasn't that clear. No, it wasn't that clear. Doing back and vocals it must on have been something with the sand. Ronnie James Dio's Holy Diver. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were sort That's of a dream of mine. We were clowning around before the interview, mm. just saying that you know there could possibly be a sequel, but it sounds like there really could be a sequel to this. Well, there's a lot of <laughs> VHS and beta cam left. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. There's lots of interviews that just waffle on. You'd never pick it. <laughs> I was just wondering, is there anybody out there like with this. <laughs> Is there anybody out there with a beta player that yeah. actually works yeah. left if you could contact us? Yeah. So when you were first approached with the idea of making a movie about your life, Ross, you know, what was your reaction? Well, it was not really about my life. It was just going to be more about the band. But I suppose a bit more of me snuck in there than what I originally thought. So <laughs> Yes, it says <laughs> evil laugh from the filmmaker. <laughs> but look, at the end of the day, I didn't give a fuck. I thought, well, I might as well get it out there. And, mm. and like for me, watching it is, you know, if you take yourself out of it, it's a great sort of rundown of music of that time. And, and Matt's done a great job of capturing that time, I reckon. And for me, like, I have belly laughs because it brings back for every minute I see on, I've seen on that Matt's film, it brings me back about two weeks of laughing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just... I just remember all the good times. And there weren't too many bad times as far as the band goes. I guess musically it, it really does document that moment just before Seattle and the grunge mm. uh, sound happened. But you were such an influence in, in that happening. Was that, you know, just timing? Or, you know, like We're talking about blokes from the other side of the planet interview, uh, influencing one of the biggest music uh, uh, trends that 
that happened in the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah, it's probably the biggest fluke that ever happened, you know. It's sort of just, it's just by chance, I think, that, you know, we were around then or someone maybe had a... It's a punk band, isn't it? I mean, you didn't go out and say, we're going to be something different. You're just what you are. Yeah. Yeah. And we went over there and we didn't influence jack shit musically. We used to make them laugh. Mm. So that's my theory. Yeah. So That's a big thing. If you can make people laugh, they remember you. They're pretty serious lot over there. Mm. It's fucking cold for a start. Mm. <laughs> I don't know Nick Cave's made it so far. I don't make anybody laugh. Well, uh, anyway, we won't talk about it. If he gets a few more games <laughs> and he's, uh, yeah. and he's set... I'm maybe, sure he has a, sense, a good off. sense of humour. Yeah. Shouldn't write him off. So when did you first notice that you were having an influence on, you know, American acts? Was that after, you know, putting out the record through Sub Pop Records? No, not really, because, look, I've been oblivious to all this stuff. I didn't really care. You go over there, you meet blokes. That does, some of them are in bands, some of them aren't in bands, and I never followed the music scene that much. You know, I, I used to go over there and drink with my mates, but I didn't go over there because there was some kind of music being played there. or And I didn't know if I was drinking with the T-shirt seller, the mm. lead singer, or the bloke that drove the van, or someone that was going to see him. I had no idea. No idea whatsoever, because I haven't got radio. Where I live, there's no radio, there's no... I don't have a computer. Imagine that. It's great. <laughs> Your first big hang with Eddie Vedder ended up being a sports day too, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't Eddie Yeah, a... yeah well, the, the first day with Ed, he just goes, well, there's some guitar shops and uh, we'll go to these cool music stores. And I looked in the back of his ute and I saw a baseball and a tennis rack and I said, let's go fucking hit a ball. Mm. So, you know, that was more fun like that. It's hanging around drinking beer and... Talking crap. Yeah. So how did you meet Eddie Vedder? Oh, just through other mates over there. So just, yeah, just through mates, through mates, through mates. Yeah, we were supposed to go to a big Pearl Jam show over there. We had a private room for us and all this stuff, a super box or whatever at some dome. But me and Lucan from Mudhoney decided it would be more fun hanging around his kitchen drinking beer and he'd come around after the show and that was it. Mm. Well, marriage made in heaven. And now, you know, Eddie Vedder is one of the biggest rock stars in the world and Matt Weston gets him to stick a 50-cent piece up his ass for your movie. Well, I'd, he was actually intending to do that whether I asked him to do it or not, <laughs> thankfully. But, uh, yeah, he brought his own 50-cent coin and everything. <laughs> Which I, I was surprised that he carries that 50-cent coin everywhere. That coin that you gave him, mm. he has kept. It's like a charm. Mm. Oh, he's a good bloke like that. I left a windshooter in his hotel room one time and he carried that round for six years till he gave it back to me. Every time I saw him, he goes, God damn it, I got your windshield off. <laughs> and it was something I just cut the sleeves off. It was just an old bloody oil rag, really. Yeah. You know, he returned that, so it's a bloke you can trust. Mm. You, you'll, if, if you lend him five bucks, he'll pay you back. Right. Yeah, don't worry about that. Yeah. So you know, it must be pretty incredible, though, that these people actually cite you as their influence. <sighs> yeah. does that not mean anything? Nah, honestly, and it, look, I'm not just saying it, it doesn't mean anything. They're good blokes, you know, all that, that, that whole band are good blokes. I've met a lot of good blokes, a lot of them aren't in bands. They're just good blokes. Yeah. And at the end of the day, yeah, they're professional, they're one of the world's biggest bands, they're great, they put on a great show, they're all good blokes. But you take them away from that and you see my kids playing with their kids and everyone's just dagging around drinking beer. They just don't walk around talking music all the time. Mm. They'd rather be talking about stubbing their toes or they can't get their lawnmower started. Stuff mm. like that. So who was influencing you? Uh, oh, well, mine gets probably my father. He used to bash the shit out of me. <laughs> 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 now, music-wise... Alice is actually a lovely guy. He's a, my, I, I, <laughs> I still work he... with my old man. We've got a wonderful relationship. But my um, music influence, well, as a kid, it was the, Billy Thorpe was the first real influence I had in music from that Sunbury thing and just ACDC, Rose Tattoo. The punk stuff. The, then the Sex punk Festival. Kiss, big uh-huh. Kiss fan. Sweet. And then yeah, when the punk stuff started, it was perfect. Mm. So that was my influence. And then my record collection just come grinding to a halt. You know, I can still go and buy records from that era that I haven't bought. Mm. I'm not very adventurous music. Where does it stop? Is it um, like 1980? <laughs> yeah... Yeah, maybe. I bought the odd one. I get given some. That's pretty good. Mm. But, yeah, just hold... Because there's a lot of stuff to go back to. Mm. So, you know, you don't always have to keep going over the horizon because as Columbus said, you know, you can always fall off the end of the earth. So let's just hang around here where it's nice and safe mm. just in case the world is flat. Mm. You just never know, do you? <laughs> you never know. What were you listening to, Dean? Me? Yeah. Pretty much the same sort of stuff. I guess 
maybe the punk stuff more and less of the the early 70s rock stuff. I sort of discovered that later on. But it, I loved the less sort of revival stuff in the 80s too, those sort of mod kind of, you know. The, Pseudo the, echo stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I really liked that. I really mm. liked that. Yeah, Duran Duran. I was right <laughs> into that. Yeah. I try and sort of work that into kind of what we're doing these well, days. Well, they're still going. Good on them. Yeah, good on them. Mm. I haven't got an album of theirs yet. I might have. Maybe I will go. Well, there you go. There's something for Ross to still buy. Yeah. 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 But, you know, I guess, you know, alternative to the psychos, you're doing the Chris Russell uh, chicken walk thing mm. there for a while. Yeah. Um, which is another. Music style altogether again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the brews. Mm. Yeah, yeah, which really, it's rock and roll's just, uh, you know, like a cousin of the blues. Mm. You know, you sort of break all that, break it all down and it's all folk music, even jazz, you know, met, extreme metal, you know, slow it down a bit and it's just rock and roll, isn't it? Mm. So tell yeah. me about your introduction into the Cosmic Psychos and joining the band. Um, my baptism of fire, mm, which it must have been. Well, it was uh, fire I'd, water. <laughs> baptism of fire water. Um, I had been playing in a little kind of side project that Ross had been doing called Done, with a guy called Kieran Clancy, because the psychos weren't doing much. But this is all in the movie too. Probably goes into a bit 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 better, but um, and then uh, he had a bit of a disagreement with Bill and a few things that were going on there and Bill this is Bill Walsh with William yeah the Bill drummer. Bill sort of you know, was gone and then um, Ross rang me up and asked me to be in it and uh, I've been in ever since mm. you know I haven't been trusted with the money though <laughs> what money <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know the, the movie does show that you know Bill uh, really looked after the finances of the band, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Bill did a lot for the band too, other than just looking after the finances. You know, he he, he used to keep the thing going. You know, mm. without Bill's manner and Bill's drive, we should say, you know, the band probably wouldn't have got half as far. Like, he was the one pushing us to go overseas. The sneaky little bastard would say, oh, we're going to go to over America or we're going to go back to Europe. And I'm going, no, nah, no, nah, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. And then, oh, maybe... And then two weeks before we'd go, he'd go, right, we're leaving on this date. Mm. You know, he'd, just, he'd be sneaky. But, but, you know, Bill used to get a lot... He was well-connected and he used to sort of push it and, you know, that's where he wanted to be. And well, booking time with Butch Vig, I mean, that was pure genius, really. Yeah, all like, that kind of stuff Bill was sort of the mastermind of. Like, mm. you, know, he, it's, you know, we weren't great musos, but he was, he was pretty good at, at, at pumping up his own tyres and pumping up the band's tyres, mm. put it that way. What's your relationship with Bill now? I have a beer with him. Went to see him up the other night at his bar, and yeah, no worries. I mean, what are two ball men fighting over a car? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned the, the Butch Vig thing there, and you know, you know what, uh, you know, an amazing uh, part of the movie to hear the story from Butch Vig himself about. You know, you guys being in the studio with him. And, and Cosmic Psychos were the band immediately after Nirvana recorded Nevermind. If yeah, I yeah, just got believe. in there. We got a bit of a sneak, sneak preview. We'd had a couple of demos that had been smuggled to us from a few members of the band and a few fill-in drummers. So we, and, well, we didn't spread them around, but we used to play them on tour in Europe and stuff. So we had a fair idea what the new material was worth. But when we heard Butch's version of uh, what he'd done, it was pretty, you could tell it was something was going to happen there. Mm. It's something, it was just, it was unbelievable. Mm. It was unbelievable. You could already tell that it, it had crossed over from that. You, you could just write, write it out then, mm. there and then. Something mm. about it. Mm. And it, you know, it proved right too. There's the story in the movie uh, of L7, who are very big fans of uh, Cosmic Psychos. And uh, Danita tells a story about writing, you know, one of their songs unintentionally lifting one of your riffs mm. and then how that song then gets covered by the prodigy mm. uh, did that end up being like the big earner for the band then as a result of that you know from uh, if you a listen, publishing perspective you li listen to all the hype you'd think it was you're going to be it was we're going to be instant millionaires i went to footy training after it was in the newspaper the coach dragged all the players in he goes this is the worst training session i've ever seen you blokes do 
you're all playing like millionaires. Get over there. And he goes, Nighty, you're accept, accept you. You're <laughs> over there. So it was all this big running joke. I walked into the local pub. I got a round of applause because I was going to be rich. Then everyone wanted me to buy them beers. <laughs> and right from the start, I knew it wasn't going to be much because there's all of L7 and there was all of us. And we only getting a tiny little bit of a little bit of a mechanical part of something else. Yeah. So I knew right from the start it was crap because the paper rang me up and wanted this big story and I go, fuck off, there's nothing here, <laughs> nothing to see, move on. And uh, anyway, Bill rang with it, so that was good. Yeah. And look, dribs and drabs, I, I ran out and bought a motorbike. I thought, fuck, I'm going to buy a Harley. So I go to this shop and I go, I'm going to be a millionaire, I'm going to buy a Harley, I'm going to get all this money. So I bought it on my friggin' Visa card <laughs> and I thought, I'll pay this off in two weeks. Five years later, I still owed seven thousand bucks on the fucking thing, so, so it didn't work. Yeah. But um, it was a pretty funny story, though. Yeah, but you found the uh, the newspaper article mm. that uh, that Bill had done. So you know, tell us about that finding mm. uh, finding the actual article itself, and you know that makes its way into the movie as well. well funnily enough, that like you know the process along the year or year and a half I was working on the film was trying to track down all the materials to cut in. And I think I'd gone up to Ross's farm to screen him a copy of the movie for the first time. And essentially it was, you know, getting close to a lockdown cut. And uh, we polished off a few bottles of wine, I think, and he said, before you go, I'm just going to check the shed because I might have, I think it was another another weightlifting photo Mm. or something like that. Let me just check the shed. So we went out to the shed and we found something like six of these massive plastic tubs full of psychos, photos, memorabilia, newspapers, all kinds of stuff that he had previously hadn't had access to for the past two 18 years. months or so. And of course, so we went and spent the next two hours digging out stuff and I found, you know, from the early day, the early days sort of part of the film, pr- pretty much every single photo I found when I'd thought I'd already locked down the edit and that was, I had everything that I had and that newspaper, of course, mm. was... I knew it was there somewhere. Gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was good. That was lucky. Yeah. We just got another box of stuff today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, that would have been handy. I'm I'm done. Done. Of the woodwork. Uh, yeah, maybe there will be a two. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking yeah. there has to be. Um, you know, you talk about the Palom, uh, the Palomino Pizza uh, EP, which get, get, gets discussed in the movie. <laughs> not one of your best works, not one of your, your favourite rec- recordings. Oh, I'm, just, uh, I'm offended. <laughs> No, no, that was no pizza. Like, I don't know. We, we weren't ready to go and do anything, and it just it was push, 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 push. Let's go and do something. Let's go. And, and they're like, well, we haven't got anything. So we did a couple of covers, and then... A bit of Thorpey, a bit of Lobby. I think that yeah. Thorpey cover's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. That was yeah, famous. It was 2.30 thir- in the morning, that one. That was a ripper. Jeez, mm. I, was on my, I was on my bloody vocal cords were fantastic about then. <laughs> but, uh, and then we... In about two seconds, wrote a couple of original songs. It just, it just thrown together. We, you know, it was just, yeah, just not a. And there's nothing against the, the, the tributes for 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 the, for the Orpie and Buffalo and all that kind of stuff, but uh, no, nah, it was a crap record. Mm. And the cover's just as good as the record. Oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> Who yeah, did that cover? Who, I who don't drew know. It? Someone took a photo of the inside of a sick bag or something. Probably, <laughs> probably, probably offended somebody, and the, they put a lot of hard work in it. But nah. Yeah. No, not for me. Oh, what a lovely pie has to be the best album title of all time. That was good fun, and we had, that was a twenty-three hour photo shoot for that cover too. We had a lot of good times doing <laughs> that, except uh, it was a bit of a clean up afterwards. But yeah, that was pretty good fun. That was done in a uh, a studio in New York with um, lots of extras and lots of pretty ladies things, and they're all good friends of ours actually, all really good friends. So it was just a laugh, just an absolute laugh. Mm. It was a great photo shoot. Probably the most touching part of the entire movie is uh, the Robbie Watts story, and you know, right up to to Robbie's death. That must have like torn you apart the way it gets portrayed in the movie. Oh, I couldn't watch it yeah, the no. first time, but uh, yeah, and look, still really don't want to talk about it. Mm. It's yeah. It's always when I cut out to go to the toilet. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. You know, I still find it hard to watch that. Yeah. Was there ever a point where you thought, you know, that would be the end of the band? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, the, the few days afterwards or the first week, you're just going, shit, you know, what, what can you do? He's a big, he's a big part of our lives, you know, really big part of our lives. Still missing. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah. Well, the movie is uh, Blokes You Can Trust. These are the three blokes you can trust. The man who made the movie, Matt, over here. Dean and Ross from the Cosmic Psychos. And we thank you, uh, all of them for joining us here at Noise 11. Cheers. Go on, thanks for that. Danke schön, as they say in German. Really? I thought that was Sydney-ish. Oh. In it's Sydney. not much of a German region. All those people in Sydney, Dunkerfern. <laughs> oh, hang on, that's South Australia. Oh.